Ecophila, the weaver ant, they're predatory. Here they've caught a large white bug. They're gonna carry it up to the nest and tear it to pieces inside. I love stories and the stories from nature, from nature that I like are the stories people haven't seen before and particularly the ones people aren't expecting. And I love to get people excited about things they don't think they're gonna like, like spiders. Because when you're a spider male and you're out there trying to get a female, it's the same struggle that he's having, that we're all having when we're trying to find the love of our lives. In a single nest in the middle, well protected, is the single queen, a big, plump, slightly green. And so it's the same story throughout nature with all these different colors and approaches and techniques. And everybody has their own way of solving the same problems in their lives. Once people realize that, they connect all the dots and can become more comfortable with nature. I'm gonna start off by talking about the way I began. And I grew up uh, 15 years ago, in fact, I think I talked more about this, uh, climbing trees. Uh, this is a uh, tree from Harvard Yard that I took for an article for National Geographic. I actually had to put my head in a hole to get this view and lie on my stomach, and the police were called twice. So I eventually put a sign on my back saying, National Geographic photographer, please leave me alone. <laughs> I've left it there ever since. Uh, in any case, um, grew up climbing trees. So here I am in Ohio. How many of you climbed trees as kids? Yeah. And I still do a lot of studies on trees, look at trees in different ecosystems around the world, uh, have climbed trees with uh, amazing uh, character and architecture, some of the world's largest trees out in the West Coast. Uh, but for National Geographic, it gives me another opportunity outside of ecology to tell stories about the things I love, particularly when I was a kid, outside of the science. And so I have this wonderful chance of just pursuing things in nature and presenting them as stories to people, which is what I love to do. And uh, people ask me, how is, what is it like to be at National Geographic? Do they, like, do they ever digitally alter pictures? And I say, uh, no, we're a very pure people here, though I was rather shocked by the Japanese version of uh, this cover. It was <laughs> really threw me off. But, Otherwise, uh, uh, it's the place to be to tell stories, and it has been for us longer than a century. And you can pick out all kinds of stories and tell them. You can pick out stories from your backyard. So one of the things I did when I was a kid is look a lot in acorns. And I found out there was a whole ecosystem within an acorn. And this ecosystem starts when a beetle or a moth, we'll talk about the beetle, this is the acorn weevil with that huge nose, look at that uh, long skinny proboscis there, uh, lands on an acorn, this is right, living right around Washington DC, uh, and it looks like it's an alien. Here it is here, and what it does is it has a completely round head living inside that, uh, inside that capsule there, you see there? and it actually rotates that head back, back and forth, and like an oil rig, gradually saws a hole right to the center of the acorn, turns around, lays an egg, and flies away. And a little uh, grub grows up inside that acorn, eventually pushes out its head, and it's like toothpaste coming out of the tube. This is the grub version of the acorn weevil making its appearance on this earth and plops to the ground and leaves an opening for other things to get in. And you can look at the whole, uh, everything about ecology happens inside a single acorn once it's breached. So over time, a whole community enters the acorn. And one of the things I love to do is open up acorns and find out what's happening inside them and the story that unfolds. It's a simple thing to do. If, you're, if you've got kids or you like to think like a kid, try some acorns, just drop them into water, and the ones that float have creatures living inside of them. It turns out that the mice and the squirrels, which we normally think of as the enemies of acorns, they're eating them, they're the only way acorns survive. 
And uh, these mice, for example, and squirrels do the same thing, bury acorns in little caches. And in fact, if you uh, follow the fate of the acorns, uh, there was one researcher who buried a thousand acorns all over the place and returned to the next day and every one of them had moved. So if you could actually mark acorns, you would find out that they're like animals. They're actually shooting across the landscape as different uh, mice and squirrels dig them up and carry them to another spot. And so acorns might travel miles, carried from place to place to place to place by these animals before they are allowed to uh, sprout. Another story, another backyard story. This was once a very successful beetle that occurred all across the eastern United States. Uh, now it's restricted to Block Island and very small patches otherwise. The American bearing beetle, an endangered species. Uh, but there are bear bearing beetles of different kinds in different places. Uh, and this thing is on a dead rat. And without them, we'd have a dead rats everywhere. It would not be pleasant. And so here's another story of being a photographer. I ended up at home with a lot of dead rats in the refrigerator and bearing beetles. And these are lovely beetles. These are one of the few animals that form a monogamous pair. They mate for life. And they actually bury the rat together. They roll it up into a ball and transform it into a squishy mass. And that's over to the right side of this picture. That was once a rat. And on top of it, they lay their eggs. And it's like a bird nest, but it's a rat. And the <laughs> larvae grow up. And here they are regurgitating rat to babies, one of the few morally high note animals that I can mention. <laughs> Another thing to do for National Geographic and to tell stories is to pick an animal that everyone thinks they know and explore it in new ways. And so for some time, I was traveling around the world looking at praying mantises. And praying mantises are familiar to everybody. They're loved by people everywhere. Here's a Burmese boy with a mantid in his hands. And so we all kind of have an affinity to them uh, in a way that we don't to most insects. But as you travel around, you find extraordinary ones. I photographed a bunch of them for a story last year. Here's one. Can you see the insect? This is the head, the arm, and that's the tail end and legs of a mantis that's trying very hard to look just like lichen. That previous one was from uh, South America. This one is from Africa, a giant mantid eating a gecko. So everywhere you go, you look for things and you find stories. And the fun thing is that there are stories out there that nobody knows. Most of nature uh, photography and nature documentaries rehashes the same stuff, but there are extraordinary stories about uh, all about the world. Uh, and every creature that we think we know in an ordinary way becomes extraordinary if we look at it in a new fashion. The ants are fabulous. They're all female societies. They get along perfectly. It's great. <laughs> they don't need males. Here's a, a couple of soldier uh, army ants in Central America. Uh, what do you think they do with those jaws? Anything pleasant? Well, probably not. Uh, the soldier army ants are actually uh, full-time defenders against vertebrates like a you and me. And uh, this is my finger a moment later. And uh, if you remember the length of the jaws in the previous image, you can imagine they're down to the bone. And they're also stinging at the other end. So it's uh, uh, a little bit of things going on everywhere at once. <laughs> and uh, I actually photographed the queen. I managed to get a picture of the queen during her migration for National Geographic. And I had to put my head down on the ground and a whole bunch of soldiers, because she swarmed with soldiers, uh, went all over my head. And I had to tweezer them out all night, basically, because their jaws have little recurved tips. They really do look like uh, fishing hooks with these little recurved knife blades at the end. Uh, so we all grow up, and we all love things that we saw as kids. Rainforests were a big thing for me, but I apparently love the deserts as well as my parents say when here I am in some sand dunes in Colorado. So I find my way to deserts sometimes. Here I am with Warren Savory. And you find as you travel around, there are eccentric people 
uh, all over the world. A lot of them concentrated in the US for some reason. <laughs> um, this is Warren Savory, who works for Food and Drug. And uh, his thing is Saul Pugids, a group of creatures that no one talks about. They're called wind scorpions sometimes. Uh, they're often big and nasty. Here we are in uh, the deserts of the southwest looking for them. There's one in this cup, not too big. And uh, I started thinking, well, these are kind of cool. What can I do with these? And I heard about huge ones overseas. Uh, the cool thing about them is that the Saul Pugids have the most enormous jaws for their body size of any living thing. Uh, they're not a scorpion. They're not anything else. They're their own group. And here's one scissoring apart a lizard. And they have these horrif horrific heads that kind of come apart as they uh, jam their jaws at different angles and kill and eat things. So I decided to go after the biggest ones I could and went to Iran and the first scientific expedition there uh, a little over 10 years ago uh, by uh, Americans. And uh, I had a great time. Uh, the Iranians were wonderful. I even snuck into Afghanistan on my own. Those were the days. And, uh, <laughs> found all kinds of creatures, including the giant saw fugitives. And it turns out these things get several inches uh, across. And uh, they don't know how to do anything without aggression. So sex in saw fugitives involves either the female eating the male or the male beating the female uh, so badly that she can't eat him. So she staggers off afterwards. Uh, I'm not saying anything more about that. We had a, so here I am with a Bob Macy, another scientist, uh, looking at a salt fugit eating a gecko in Iran. I actually got stuck out in the middle of the desert with an Iranian group of military, and the military were terrified of them because uh, the people in that region believe that salt fugits will eat your face if you sleep. So they refused to sleep to sleep, and they started smashing them in the middle of the night whenever they got close to me. And I had a screaming match with the military that went on for about uh, two minutes with the head of the military face to face with me like this. And we eventually decided we were both macho enough to uh, go out and collect salt fugits together. And I had a wonderful conversation with these guys with sentences like, they only knew about 10 words of English. One of them was, dinosaurs live America. They had clearly seen Jurassic Park. And uh, Michael Jackson human. <laughs> Galapagos, uh, a wonderful place to go. And I've worked there with a, a, a really brilliant guy, Frank Sulloway, who studied there for years. Frank is one of these very serious scientists most of the time. <laughs> but he's also a little bit eccentric. So he travels with 12 teddy bears. And uh, many people know about the teddy bears and know the names of the teddy bears. So if you meet Frank, be sure to say hello to Darwin Bear, which is the lowest bear. In the Galapagos with Frank, the first time I was there, just to give you a flavor of what it's like to work in a research team, Frank decided we should have the best diet. And for him, the best diet was to have the, the most calories and the least weight, because we had to carry all this stuff. So I arrived at the Galapagos to find a pile of 1,400 Snickers bars. <laughs> Gary Dodson studies another kind of unusual creature. Uh, that I heard about as a child and never seen photographed. And these are the fighting flies. Uh, these are stag flies he's watching down below him. They come to recently fallen trees. And they were described by Alfred Russell Wallace, an early explorer. And no one had really done much with them since. But they're wonderful things. They're sort of like what Dr. Seuss would do with a fly. They're multicolored with all kinds of weird attributes, including these. And this is a one that's sort of like a deer with these stag uh, horns in the front. They even have musk glands like deers do, and they form lex, and uh, they fight and clash their horns together, their antlers. And there's usually a female waiting nearby, and she's going for the guy with the best territory on this fallen log, exactly like deer. Uh, these flies vary quite a bit. You ever watch the movie The 40-Year-Old Virgin? Uh, this particular male fly would be a 40-year-old virgin because his antlers are little stubs. So some flies have huge antlers and stub fly some flies have small ones. And one of the great things that Gary Dotson does 
is a little bit of uh, special restoration work for the flies in need. And here he is gluing extensions on <laughs> to uh, impoverished males. And it turns out that once they have the extensions, they're fabulous. <laughs> this is a, a species that is uh, more like a moose with gigantic antlers. Look for stories wherever you can find them. Sometimes they're the unexpected little things. And one place I have often found stories, and I've been uh, working on uh, various things about the ecology of this little ecosystem, are the surfaces of leaves. And in the rainforest, leaves can have tiny little plants growing on them called epiphylls. So the subject of this picture isn't this crane fly. It's these tiny little things at its feet. And these are minute plants. And if you could blow them up, they would look something like a forest on the surfaces of single leaves. So here you have a sprouting uh, plant on a leaf surface in a rainforest and all kinds of other plants there. And you can find things like this is a, a liverwort. And this is, uh, believe it or not, a lichen. It's a leafy lichen, minute thing. And these are little fungi growing in forests on the surfaces of single leaves. And there are all kinds of stories about leaves and how leaves interact. It's not easy being green in the forest, neither for frogs nor for plants. And uh, here's a leaf sawing apart another leaf. The uh, Johnny Appleseed of the epiphylls, these tiny little plants, is this ant in Borneo. This ant actually goes around and feeds on these minute plants and actually disperses their uh, tiny little spores from place to place, planting them from place to place. So you get these little colonies of different kinds of plants growing on a single leaf. Here's a cordyceps fungus. Uh, it's an ant that's been invaded. Its brain has been taken over by this fungus. It's died on a leaf surface up in the treetops. Uh, and what happens is that the fungus enters its brain, takes over the mind of the ant, uh, which causes the ant to climb the tree and die up there, gripping onto a leaf. And the fungus then sprouts these reproductive organs that come out its top, and the ant uh, serves as a vessel for the reproduction of this thing. A very bizarre little story. And of course, nothing like the Chinese to make it more interesting, because for them, these uh, mind control fungi are medicinal. And uh, this woman in Tibet and China is actually connect, uh, collecting little uh, caterpillars that have been taken over by these fungi down there on the ground. And a few years ago, these things were made famous because uh, several women in China broke world records in running, uh, supposedly from taking this as a drug. Uh, these have been used as drugs for 20 centuries in China. Frogs are fun. Uh, most people love frogs. The only frog I've heard complaints about is the Chinese stinky frog. This is it. But uh, fortunately, you can't smell it from here. This is uh, a roasted frog from Ivory Coast. It is uh, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit out. And this kind of frog will actually apply itself to the side of a leaf and dry out and just sit there covered with a kind of shellac. So if you've ever had one of those little children's things where you say, just add water, that's what happens with this frog. It unfolds into a frog at the first rain. Uh, poisonous frogs have been one of my favorite things because they've got fabulous behavior, and uh, they're often used as medicine. So there, there are medical purposes to some of these species. Uh, here's a frog that lives in an island in Panama in huge numbers. This is uh, the poison dart frog species that um, actually lives on an island covered with frogs and tarantulas. And every once in a while, you find a tarantula on its back writhing and, and dying while foaming at the mouth that presumably got bit or was bit by one of these frogs by accident. In Africa, you can find people using poisonous beetles. These are the Kung Bushmen. And these beetles are actually used for their weapons over there, their bows and arrows. Uh, their arrows are coated with the larvae of this beetle. The frogs have the same purpose to some South American tribes. And this is the most impressive of them, Terribilis, the terrible one. It was described in 1977 
uh, by a research team that went down there and found that it was so toxic that it was potentially lethal to the touch. And so I decided to come back a few years ago. I was the first uh, outsider to visit this area uh, since its discovery. And this is the frog here, and you see it has quite a bit of attitude. It's like, you're like, it's a deadly frog. And it's hard to say, oh, please, why shouldn't I pet this thing? But because it comes up and goes, come on, touch me. Come on, come on. And uh, I had to get within two inches of this frog for the picture, so it was quite intriguing. Here's how you collect them, the Embarrah Choco Indians in this um, little village in Colombia in a remote valley, put them in special uh, containers like this. Uh, this is the only time I ever saw one of these uh, Indians touch a frog, and I think he was trying to impress me, and his finger went numb. Uh, but what do you, you do is you take one of the blowgun darts and you touch it to the back of the frog and it's good for a year. Here they are making the blowguns, which was fun to, to watch and as well. The tricky part is that they had certain sort of games down there they, de they developed, and one was, why not shoot blow darts close to the funny foreign guy <laughs> to see if he reacts? <laughs> and this whole thing just, after a couple of days. And uh, anyway, it was a complicated story. It involved me uh, using blowguns in defense against drug lords by the end of it to get out of there because we were caught between a rock and a hard place for sure. Uh, I won't tell you the whole thing, but it's one of those great stories that uh, uh, you find National Geographic people able to do. Uh, the fun part of the story for me was going to Panama later and looking at the love laugh of the poison dart frog. And this is the top male on his log. He's the king of the king of the log. And he beat up any other male that came along. I, I both hate this picture because I hate stagey looking portrait pictures, but he's just too cute. And people always ask me if I glued the hands together. <laughs> Here's Kyle Summers, a researcher, following a frog up the tree here. And she's looking for uh, a bromeliad. You know, those plants are the pineapple top plants. So there are little ones here, but she's looking for a big one, like these in the treetops. You see these thorny masses, and those hold water in, the, in their centers. And she finds one of those little pools, she backs in, and she deposit, deposits her tadpole in that little private pond. And now she walks back down to the ground and picks up the next tadpole and she delivers it to another tree in another spot. Why does she go to all this work? It turns out that tadpoles, unlike the adult frogs, aren't poisonous yet, and so they'll be eaten by things like these canopy crabs. This one will probably just scoot over and eat that one right away. So she doesn't put all her eggs in one basket. She scatters them around, and now the great part She's distributed two dozen, three dozen tadpoles in different places. She goes down to the ground and starts doing her normal froggy things, uh, which are usually eating ants. This is where these frogs get their poisons. They eat a lot of ants, which are, of course, full of uh, poisons in their stings and so forth, and they transform those poisons. Uh, but she just does her normal froggy things for a few days, and then suddenly she starts climbing the trees again, and she manages to remember where she put all two dozen tadpoles scattered in three-dimensional space, a memory feat that beats squirrels and just about anything else, even though a frog's brain isn't supposed to be very big or very uh, sophisticated. And so she now goes back up and she looks into each pool where she left her tadpole baby, and the tadpole, if it's still there, will raise its tail and wiggle the tail to say, hello, mom, <laughs> kind of sign language for tadpoles. And she backs in and she lays a little infertile egg, and you see the tadpole behind her here in the water, and that egg is her, the omelet of her baby for the next few days. So she tends all her babies for the next couple of months as they develop into young frogs, an amazing feat of motherhood. Well, serious scientists abound, of course, and uh, for some years I was at Berkeley, and I, I came from Harvard, and everyone in Harvard was, you know, there was a little tension floating around there, so I went to Berkeley, and they were so laid back, I couldn't resist moving there for a while and working with them. So here we have some of the leading scientists 
of Berkeley. Uh, Ted Poppenfuss is here. He studies lizards in Iran and other places with no government. He likes places with no government. Uh, Jim Patton studies rats. He can tell rat species apart by taste. Uh, <laughs> David Wake is the leader in frog, the loss of frogs around the world. And at the far end, uh, we have Harry Green who studies snakes. And what are they doing here, do you suppose? Oh, don't know, it's so obvious. <laughs> They're putting on pantyhose. <laughs> They're from Berkeley, but it has nothing to do with Berkeley. <laughs> they are simply uh, preparing to protect themselves from leeches. I prefer leeches over pantyhose any day. <laughs> Here's uh, Harry Green collecting a venomous tree snake. And I've uh, worked with a lot of snake people. I love snakes. And uh, I've had many fun experiences with snakes. This was one of the more fun ones because this is not a snake. Anyone can tell what this is? It, it is, in fact, a flatworm, which is a worm so primitive it has no brain, and yet it is managing to mimic a snake with a, kind of a snaky head at this end. That's a species I discovered in Borneo. This is Snake Island, and it's an uh, island off of Sao Paulo that has the most venomous snakes in the world, one every two square yards. So within this little lit area here, there would be maybe one and a half to two of them. And the really cool thing is I traveled uh, with a scientist who was so eager to take me to this remote island that he came even though his arm was broken. And uh, so he staggered up the hill with poisonous snakes on every side and showed me proudly this species, which lives only on this single island. And its poison is so toxic because on this island, it has to kill seabirds before they can take off and fly more than a couple of feet. Joe Slowinski uh, was one of the great snake people. He had discovered new species of cobra working in Burma and remote parts of China. And I traveled with him uh, in 2001. And a, a story that was very personal for me because Joe had tried to get me to go on trips for years. And I finally was able to go on this one to a, a very remote village. This is uh, the day before he died. And he was hit by a crate, which is a minute version. It's a small kind of cobra. And he uh, had reached into a snake bag, uh, not realizing it was a real s crate. He thought it was a mimic of a crate. And there was a great deal of uh, agony over this decision that he made at the moment. This happened uh, just as the towers were falling in uh, uh, September 11th. So we got out of Burma to find uh, that our news mattered nothing because we had no idea. It took us three days to even find out what happened in the US. And uh, it led, led me to think a lot about what matters to people in nature. I mean, Joe, as he was lying there dying, we kept him going for a long time through mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth resuscitation, but uh, what was he thinking about? And I like to think he was thinking about how much he loved snakes and nature, because true nature requires that you take risks. If everything is turned into a garden, nature disappears. This is the snake that got him. It was about 10 inches long. This is a man who made the right decision. This is a Russian I met working in Vietnam, and he had actually chopped off his finger after being bitten by a snake. So you, you do these things despite the risks because that's what nature is about. Nature is about uh, having, it's like falling in love. Love is a risk. Anything that you devote yourself to that has meaning is going to involve some risks, and wiping those risks, uh, risks away doesn't help anything. And there are many of the people I deal with are great at finding ways of keeping the risks low, but making great stories and adventures and learning about the world. Uh, the last trip I did, well, a couple trips back now, we dropped down a quarter mile deep into a sinkhole. And uh, at the bottom of this hole, found a forest in its shaded depths, including two new species of frogs. And this is the great news about frogs. Frogs are going extinct. They're very fragile, but we're also finding a lot of them at the same time. So we have both the great positive news about uh, diversity. We found a couple thousand species in the last few years, 
and also these horrendous things happening to frogs around the world as many species are declining in numbers. I've looked for all kinds of things over time. It's not fair to be an entomologist and be you know, uh, impressed by size, but still I did once look for the world's largest insect, and it's this weta uh, from New Zealand. This thing is 71 grams. I broke the record for an adult insect, at least. For frogs, though, you have to go to West Africa. And uh, there I went after the world's largest species. And I was hoping to break the record. And uh, we got to six and a half pounds. Unfortunately, the record is 7.2. So I need to go back again, I suppose. At the other end of the frog scale, I went after the smallest frog. This is a species from Brazil. We spent three days going through leaf litter, finding this tiny uh, jumping dot. Brazil is a great place to look for diversity. And I did actually, uh, for a story on the Atlantic forests of Brazil, which is the forest along the coast, uh, a story on uh, diversity just in frogs for geographic, just because there was so much to be found there that people hadn't photographed before. This is the pumpkin frog, a tiny species uh, poisonous frog fighting, biting and nipping at each other. And it turns out that they're so aggressive that they will fight with their uh, reflection in the mirror, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> you get some time on your hands in Brazil. This is the only fruit-eating frog. This species actually lives in uh, a desert-like coastal area with few insects and eats fruit. This is a marine frog uh, blending in down there next to some of the marine life. It's the only species of frog that will go down and eat things in tide pools. And so there are a whole bunch of new frogs that had never been reported on. My favorite, though, is the dancing frog. <laughs> and I think uh, it's important to uh, take back some lessons from the dancing frog. It lives in waterfalls so noisy that it can't call very effectively. It does call a little. You can see its cheek pouches here. But basically, it dances. And it does it in a very it's sort of John Travolta way. It uh, raises the leg on one side, expands it like this. It's got to be done slowly. And then a little bit of this here, and then here, 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 here. Now, while it's doing this, uh, I was told I was never going to be able to photograph this thing because it's too shy. <laughs> and uh, basically, what I did is, uh, what, what you can do in the animal kingdom, if you want to take a picture of something they say is impossible, is you realize that once a male is preoccupied with a female, you can do anything you want. <laughs> so as soon as he was dancing, I snuck right up on him. I was within three inches of him. And the female hopped up on my shoulder and uh, admired him from about this distance. Fabulous. <laughs> Canopies are a place that I like to spend a lot of time. I talked about climbing trees. Here's a red-eyed tree frog up in the canopy in Costa Rica, where this is where the species normally exists. And I'll tell you a couple of quick canopy stories uh, about frogs. There are frogs that like to glide from trees. This is the biggest of them. This is. Uh, uh, is it true that people look like they're pets? <laughs> in any case, this herpetologist discovered this lovely frog, and uh, it's the biggest of them. So it's not a very good glider. It lands with kind of a splat, but I did get a picture of it coming down. The really great glider, though, is the coqui frog. And if you ever go to Puerto Rico, this is a frog that you will see everywhere because it's the most numerous amphibian on Earth. There are about 40,000 of them per hectare, and all say coqui together every night. And so the whole island explodes with their song. And this frog has a very unusual life cycle that was only discovered a few years ago when someone got up very early and, and found out something about them. What these frogs do is they sleep near the ground where it's uh, during the day when it's too hot up in the trees. And then as sun sets, uh, there's a point in time when the birds have fallen asleep, uh, but before the tarantulas have woken up, when it's safe to climb the trees. And they all climb the trees together. It turns out tarantulas for, are the big predators of frogs. So it's not good to come out when tarantulas are awake. And they're on the tree trunks, mostly. So they all climbed the trees together during about a 15-minute period at sunset. 
And then they hop around in the canopy and do the little canopy thing all night. And then at sunrise, just as the sun is beginning to show itself, there's again a 15-minute period when it's safe to come down. That is, after the tarantulas have gone to sleep, but before the birds wake up. And suddenly, at about 5 o'clock in the morning to 5.15, in Puerto Rico, everywhere, it's raining frogs because they save time on the commute. <laughs> at the size of a frog, you can't be hurt by a fall. So you end up with just a rain of torrential rain of frogs. This is the one picture I got in focus, tarantulas. OK, we'll do a couple of uh, spiders uh, for you, because I know you're all like gearing up for uh, eight-legged here. And the tarantulas are one of my favorite groups. Uh, here's one that we caught in the act of shedding her skin. She's actually writhing out of this uh, tight little sock, which are the dark brown things above. That's her old skin. If you have a pet tarantula, this is the big mistake people make. They, they start to, uh, they fall on their back and lie dormant for a couple days. They're dormant because they're about to shed their skin. So people put a lot of tarantulas in the toilet when they're just gearing up for their skin being shed. Um, so here you go. This picture was called A New Skin for Mrs. Ugly in the World Press Awards. One of the fun places I looked for tarantulas was in caves in uh, Mexico, went down to Oaxaca with uh, Peter Sprouse here. And these tarantulas had been collected but never studied. So we looked around, found a uh, cave, went in it, eventually got in about a kilometer and found this tarantula. And the tarantula, like all cave animals, very big, slender thing, oh, no eyes, almost no eyes. And uh, Peter had tortured me on the way in because, you know, I carrying this camera bag, didn't know much about caving. And so I was kind of pleased when the, tar the tarantula, which had never been breathed on, you know, in, in millennia, no one has breathed on these tarantulas, uh, freaked out and ran up his pant leg. <laughs> and he's screaming, what do I do? What do I do? And I said, don't hurt it. It's an endangered species. <laughs> it did bite him. And I made up stories about what we would have to do if the tarantula venom was serious. But Tarantulas actually don't have any effect. It's like a bee sting. OK, three short stories on spider life. And I'm going to tell them about jumping spiders. Jumping spiders are little spiders that you will find outside this building or anywhere in the United States hopping around. They don't make nests. And they catch mosquitoes. They do a lot of good for us. And they hop. They're jumping spiders. Here's one caught in freeze frame jumping from one twig to another. And uh, the three stories are from Sri Lanka, just to give you an example from one spot. This is uh, Murmurachne lupata, uh, sort of the Jimmy Durante of the ant world, uh, of the spider world, if you uh, remember Jimmy Durante. And uh, it has this enormous nose-like affair at one end. And it wanders around, blundering into things with this giant nose. And you wonder what it's all for until you see one walk up to another uh, Murmurachne lupata spider. And then this nose, it turns out, splits down the middle and uh, unfolds two enormous fangs. And they battle with these fangs like gladiators in a duel, throwing themselves back and forth like this. And uh, this one on the far right is backing away. He's freaking out and about to take off. This one is sort of. They rear up at the end of the battle like Rocky in the ring. Remember that? It's like, whoa. Here's a tiny little fascia spider. It's about the size of a dust speck. It's not probably what you're looking at. This is a normal jumping spider over here. This is on the right side, the little fascia species. On the right side, that little clump is a tiny little spider that looks like a bit of debris. And, uh, we collected them in bamboo with Robert Jackson, the researcher that I was working with on this project. And it turns out that these little tiny spiders actually do look like debris on purpose. They actually shake their body like debris moving in the wind. So what they do for a living is that they enter the nests of normal-sized jumping spiders, like this is a mother here with her eggs. And the facius comes in looking like a bit of debris blowing in the wind. And the mother looks down and watches the facius. She has very good vision. They will actually understand TV, these spiders. They're so good in their vision. And she doesn't know what to do. 
as the facius picks up an egg and walks out with it because it's just a clump of debris blowing in the wind. Here's one that has stolen an actual baby spider from a mother, it's kind of playing with it like a cat with a mouse. And I don't know what you get around Washington, D.C., but these were common in Berkeley. You've got the, the guys with the mohawks and the little spike things. This spider kind of combines both of them. Asimonia tethepes. Now, gals, courtship is never easy. And for spiders, it's like anything else. It's a rough world out there for the guys. And it turns out that this gorgeous creature, look at this guy here. Look at those gorgeous purples and reds and yellow legs. Who wouldn't be impressed with this? Yep, it's a hard thing to do. Attracting the lady, look at her over there. She's all plump and pale on the right side. He can start making his move, but she'll just run away. This is what happens. Again and again, I saw this up in the trees. The male looks astonished as the female rushes to the other side of the leaf. And you're going like, females have rushed to the other side of the leaf for 10,000, 100,000 years in these spiders, and the male is always astonished. How did she do that? Where did she go? Well, eventually the male figures it out. That's a rule of nature. And he flips over to the correct side of the leaf, and here he is making his slow approach, and the female is looking a little nervous. Now, what you have to do, and this is a rule of courtship that I learned uh, with Melissa's <laughs> assistance, is that you have to, uh, Melissa, get over here. <laughs> you have to, you have to uh, do what this spider does. It's really right over there. What you have to do is you have to get down like this and move slowly towards the female, a behavior that we scientists call groveling. Now. <laughs> Some spiders are, thank you very much. <laughs> Some spiders are very impressed with that. Here's the female, here's the male groveling. This one is groveling so well, he is like almost falling over backwards for this female. And then uh, they get together and the male, they mate with their face. They have like little squishy things and corkscrews. Ah, it's too much to describe. <laughs> of course, mammals were much more reasonable animals. We're not like birds with all our colors and so forth. So we tend to be much more sedate, more sophisticated about our, 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 our ways of approaching the female. That's why my marriage recently was very understated on Easter Island, <laughs> very traditional. I think a ceremony hasn't changed for a thousand years. <laughs> uh, I know you've all gone through this, the stripping and the re- uh, repainting your body sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, anyway, I'm here now part of a team. We're going out for more expeditions. We're going to try to match the animals with our color and our finesse and our stories. And I hope you follow those stories in the years to come. Thanks so much. <laughs>